The history of the relations between man and jewels and precious stones goes back to the dawn of our civilization. Giving them form, choosing precious stones by their colors, people try to preserve in their inviolable and eternal essences the momentary and fragile beauty of the surrounding world. The power of imagination is capable of giving man a unique vision. But it's not enough to be able to see in a rough piece of rock a future work of art. To bring it into being, you need a team of talented individuals united by a common goal. People who understand and have a feeling for the fate of the stone. Someone asked me, what do we need stones for? And I had to reply that they're interesting, they're unusual. But really I thought, what do we actually need precious stones for? I began to think about it deeply. It's their history. They preserve our history. They must preserve some kind of information and energy. Then I thought, why is it so difficult to answer? What do you need jewels for? You need jewels to scatter them round and then to collect them up again. And lapidary miniatures, they in a certain way collect jewels and stones. We gather them together in different colours, with different energies. And in that process, the stones are transformed. For many thousands of years, an incredible game has been played between nature and man. On the one side is the coarse, wild material. On the other is intelligence in search of absolute harmony. In the 18th century, the lapidary arts in Russia went through an incredible period of development. For the construction of the new capital, St. Petersburg, a search for deposits of construction and finishing materials was organised, along with the subsequent exploitation of those deposits. By imperial decree in the Urals, in the Altai and close to St. Petersburg, factories were created that specialised in the working of hard rock. In the 19th century, the Petersburg firm of Karl Fabergé, which created works for the imperial family and the aristocracy, set standards that will be benchmarks in the lapidary arts for years to come, creating the main genres in those arts. Animalism, floral works, polychrome miniatures, the famed Easter eggs. Nevertheless, today's artists, craftsmen and jewellers aren't afraid of experimenting or searching for new ideas for their works. from the traditional genres of flowers and animalism on to total innovation in plastics in a search of new emotional sensations that a priori have never been set in stone before. Now we can already see that in the work, where there's an attempt to saturate the item, carving it in stone with totally different emotions, sensations, a spirituality, a figurativeness with goals that Fabergé never set itself. Karl Fabergé, with more than a hint of irony, described his works as precious knickknacks, sumptuous decorations for the interior, jewellery and snuff boxes of little practical value, served simply to please the eye and to demonstrate the wealth of the owner. Mm -hmm. 
a refined statuette, a flower, or some other object created by a lapidary artist or skilled jeweler undoubtedly attracts your attention when you enter a room and you find it hard to free yourself of the magnetism of this beautiful item. Stone cutting and the art of jewellery stand alone among other forms of artistic creativity, and this to a large extent is the result of the uniqueness of the basic material. It is the precious stones themselves that guide the creative conceptions of the artists and craftsmen, suggesting artistic solutions and forms to them. One of the key characteristics of the technology involved in the production of lapidary and jewellery works surrounds the cooperation of the craftsmen and artists working on one and the same project. The combination of the best facets of the various specialists is what creates a unified and harmonious work of art. What is, actually, a lapidary jewellery miniature? It's a spectacle played out by actors, in this case artists who must, in order to make sure the performance is a success, sense one another, give way to one another. They must play a role, but a very high level. They have to fit into a unified story. In a performance or spectacle, there's a director. So on the one hand, yes, there's some kind of director who has to coordinate all this, and Anna Nova has that ability. But on the other hand, it seems to me that as with any actor, like any artist, there has to be something that lies inside. The artist has to have a feel for that harmony. One of the key works of the Anna Nova Jewellery House, and a work that bears comparison with the success of a major theatrical production, is the 1812 chess set. The author of the project, Robert Melnikov, was aware of all the difficulties that were encountered by the masters in giving life to the idea, but the team did a stunning job in coping with the task. Experimentation, you could say, is our slogan. We always want to try something new, something that we haven't done before. I supported Robert's project because he'd been obsessed with it for quite some time. He'd studied the history of the year 1812. He'd studied the entire period of the war. It really was a beautiful period, if we're specifically talking about the outfits, their uniforms. You really do look at those full-dress uniforms. Now I look at that project of the chess pieces and I'm amazed. I think, Lord, how beautifully they dressed. And some of them really were just fops and dandies. Work on the chess set continued for three years. Overcoming technical difficulties and sacrificing their own ambitions, the masters received the priceless experience of collaborative creative work. In the set, you can sense an incredible concentration of mastery of the highest order and a spiritual energy of people who are devoted to their craft. I look at the chess pieces, I look at them and I understand that yes, they had to be born. They had to appear in the world. For the jewellery house, the 1812 set was something of a watershed. This major project brought the house renown. Now what? A new concept had to comprise new experience and fresh, out-of-the-ordinary ideas. Firstly, I think that the guys should be allowed to do some more modelling so that we can look at different options. Maybe we'll run a competition of some kind. Everyone has their own vision. And we'll see whose turns out best. Because it's an interesting project, the old toy. It's a toy that's been abandoned. Essentially, it could be done with some jewellery element. 
завязочки. But there are little hooks there, buttons. Как видишь. It could be a thing in itself, entirely cut out of stone, but without any excess interference. The main thing is that it has to be a doll, a sweet doll, not like a. But that's the job. We have to do a doll rather than a child. Yes, that's right. A loving nostalgia for old toys and the splendor of jewelry. It's a bold combination. It's an experiment that allows artists and craftsmen to explore a field of creative thought for the first time. And naturally, we include some jewelry elements. Certain stones should be there. That's right, it should be a jewelry piece. There shouldn't be a sense that it's a toy. We should preserve this vintage feel too. It should be really old. We can combine things. Some enamel can be used, some metal. A ring could be made of gold or of silver. Why not? That would be great. A concept, however, is far from the final embodiment of that concept. Along the way, many difficulties, unexpected discoveries and original solutions can arise. The stone itself, with its unique form and patterning, may tell the craftsman what it should become. Lapidary and jewelry arts is to adorn man's life and his surrounding environment. In a world of beautiful, refined items, we ourselves become finer. This has long been noted by art theorists. The contemplation of beautiful, skillfully made objects can often lead to a simple question: Can this really have been made by human hands? I think it has to be on some genetic level inside a person, a desire to get the effect that you need from the stone, without running counter to the stone's nature. A stone should be a stone, whatever its manifestation, whether it's a cobblestone or a very fine petal, and a person should have. Have some sort of understanding of where to stop, of what has to be added, what element from another material should be used, metal, say, or another stone or wood that can be added, so that the piece suddenly comes to life. Then it will turn into something special and unique. The relationship between the craftsman and the stone is no simple matter. Man selects the material and gives it form using his own ideas, but often the stone can demonstrate a will of its own, sending the artist off down another path. In the process of work, sometimes the colors don't accord. Sometimes the internal structure doesn't match. There are unexpected defects. There can be simple mechanical fractures during production, so you have to replace the piece. You have to start all over again. The ancient Greek philosopher Democritus wrote, "In the stone there is a spirit, just as there is in any other seed that must be born into a thing, and in giving birth to the rock it sets the internal heat of the material itself in motion through the way in which the craftsman moves the hammer, the axe, or the saw." Often the sketch is done without taking into account the color or specific properties of the stone. That's to say that first you have an abstract idea, a model is made, and only then do you work on selecting the stone. Sometimes the craftsman who's going to bring the idea to life in stone also puts his own personal desires, his sense of the piece, into the stone, and the selection of the stone can also influence that.
Since ancient times, stones have had all manner of miracle working properties ascribed to them, and the master stonecutter, like the medieval alchemist creating a magical elixir, chose various types of stones so that when combined, a secret source of beauty would be created. People have started to miss things that are done by hand, things that have a memory of the warmth of a master craftsman's hands. Now everywhere there are too many mass-produced things, machine-built things. The value of works of the lapidary and jewellery arts lies in their uniqueness, which is founded on the unique aspects of the stone itself and the individuality of the master craftsman. Each movement of his cutting tool, after all, is an expression of his deeply held personal perception of reality and his own understanding of beauty. The drive to a creative search is born from an understanding of our own capabilities or from a desire to expand them. Even in just copying an apple in stone, you have to be able to combine the viewer's perception of the model, roughly speaking the actual apple, and do that by hand, in order for your hands to do what your head wants them to do, to do what the eye sees, and that's a talent. That's because few people can put into practice the ideas of genius that they've come up with. The path from a concept to its embodiment is by no means always easy. Overcoming the obstacles along the way, however, creates experience which will be reflected in the character and style of the works of each and every artist, and in the works of the team as a whole. In the same way that multicoloured stone plates form the central picture in a Florentine mosaic, the individual style of an entire jewellery house is formed. We're now concentrating not only on the exclusive and individual works of art, the luxury segment as it were. We may decide to create a series, and then we will have to expand. It's a continual process, of course. It's continually changing. It's known that the firm Fabergé didn't just produce expensive toys for the rich, it also produced items aimed at middle-income consumers. That tradition has always been supported by Russian lapidary artists and jewellers. Pendants, earrings, jewellery boxes and spoons. The talent of a skilled master is just as clearly revealed in expensive, complex works as in modest utilitarian items. I think that the firm is distinguished by the fact that its investors provide the opportunity for experimentation, and that's very important. I've seen a lot of firms, and it's not enough that the artists are given carte blanche to discuss whatever they want at creative meetings. The Jewelry House's latest project is a collection of polychrome miniatures titled The Romanov Dynasty. The first in the line, Mikhail, ascended to the throne as a child when the country was in a time of troubles, gripped by a power vacuum. The aim was to show in him that the kingdom came to him specifically, unexpectedly. And he's wrapped up in himself, he's not ready for that. And to stress that somehow within the framework of the person posed. So he wanted to express the character of the person in the stone. The character and that life set the conditions for him. The result is exactly what you're saying, that entrapped quality, even taking fright. Unexpectedly, he suddenly became Tsar. He was given a country, 
and the scepter. And he doesn't understand why he's suddenly become a czar. Of course, to a greater extent, I'm acting as an investor, helping with the money. But of course, almost all the decisive decisions in the production of the works, they're taken together. And of course, I take part in that. I discuss all this, and as best I can, I express my tastes with regard to what can be done or what can be changed in the work. I'd like our works to become more recognizable. And we're moving towards that. We're getting closer. We're trying to set out our works. We've set them out. We want to preserve traditions. We're preserving them. We want to improve. We want to develop and raise our level. I think we've achieved that. And we're continuing to achieve that. In St. Petersburg, the tradition of working with jewels and stones has a long history. In this city of granite embankments and marble palaces and monuments, the magnificence of which makes up for any shortages of natural beauty, there is a special regard for the lapidary and jewellery arts. It's clear that this creativity differs from others thanks to the wide-ranging opportunity for creative experimentation, for searching and for self-expression. When you look at this chessboard, you realize that it's an experiment. Nothing like this has ever been done. Joining 64 squares in an ideal board, that's worth a lot. It's an experiment, and they have quite a few works like this. They're searching, forever searching. I think that the main thing is that there should be a future, that the jewellery house should have a future. And everything's in place for that. We have a history. The main thing is to carry on this work, not to stop. We've got lots of plans, ideas. The real hook here is that the studio is to some extent experimental. We've done a chessboard. We could just repeat that, say. But that wouldn't be interesting. It's a stage that we've been through. You don't want to go into the same river twice, as they say. There's a supply of ideas. What's important is that there should be an opportunity to put them into practice. As with any artist, sometimes he does a work that, in his opinion, is good. People talk about it and say, well done, you've pulled it off. Then there sometimes comes a fear of the next work. What if it's worse than the last one? That's a bit frightening. There was the chess set, it's in front of us now. There's the next project which is devoted to the Romanovs. That's also a fairly large project and it will take a few years. There may be another project. In fact, I'm sure there will be. You know, it's like a whole life. It happens progressively. The ideas, they come and you consider them. You start to think about it, that one. I want to bring that one to life.